All right, thank you so much for coming to today's Conservation Education Lunch and Learn series. Let's hear from Nick and Justin about conservation storytelling through visual media. All right, thanks, Amber. And thank mm -hmm. you all for taking some time out of your lunch today to, to join us and talk a little bit about how we can use <clears throat> visual media to help telling those conservation stories that we're all working on. Um, I'm gonna be focusing on kind of the concept of, of visual media and then talking a little bit more about video as that's, that's primarily what I work on. So to start, uh, just kind of want to do an outline of what we're going to talk about. First, I'm, I'm pretty new to Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, so I'm going to introduce myself a little bit, let you get to know me. Uh, then I'll kind of talk about the concept of visual media generally, what that word really means, um, and then talk about why we can use or why we should be using it, and then where and how we can effectively utilize that visual media as well. I'll get into some effective filming techniques, some of which you can probably use in the field yourself. Um, others are that I, you know, that I've been able to kind of hone over the years. And then I'll talk about visual media in conservation specifically. If, is it useful and is it valuable? And, you know, throughout the thing, uh, the entire presentation, please put questions that you have in the chat. Um, towards the end of the, of the presentation, Justin and I will have a chance to, to get to chat with you and answer some of those questions. So we'll get started here. So I'm uh, Nick Savage. And I am a Nebraska native, uh, born in Omaha, it's where I live now, and uh, went to Loyola University in Chicago and got a degree in environmental studies. And after that, uh, lived in Milwaukee and started doing outdoor education. Um, I moved back to Nebraska in 2014 and actually was a naturalist at Mahoney State Park. Um, <clears throat> and then I went on to Fontenelle Forest and was an outdoor educator there for uh, six years. So that really got my passion for connecting people with the outdoors and kind of being that interpretive guide um, to get people connected to nature. And um, I actually, as I was working as an educator, I got into flying drones. I really enjoyed filming with drones just for my own recreational purposes. Um, I got quite proficient at it. So I ended up starting my own aerial videography and photography company, Savage Drone, um, in 2018 and had the chance to work with some, some awesome organizations, National Park Service and National Geographic, um, PBS, a lot of really cool projects. Um, and that kind of brought me into getting hired on part time with Nebraska Game and Parks, uh, August of 2020, uh, to help with the documentary they were working on. And they kept me on board. I was going around doing a lot of drone work and, and helping out with some video projects. And then in September of 2021, I was brought on as the, the full time marketing and communication specialist to primarily doing video. Um, really the only one in the organization primarily focusing on that. And then you know, as for myself, I really enjoy hiking, getting out biking, in general, just camping and, and spending time with my family outside, favorite thing to do. Uh, and I just wanted to share this quote, it's a little long, but it's from David Attenborough, who's kind of the face of a lot of nature documentaries and the voice of those. Um, and it just focuses on that, that, that visual beauty, and it kind of made me think of my passion for sharing Nebraska's beauty with a lot of people who might not know it, so... All right, so starting with what is visual media? It's a very broad concept, actually. It basically is defined as information in the form of any visual representation, and that includes a lot of different things. Um, you know, that can, photos for one, we have our Nebraska Land Magazine, our social media pages are, are full of images. Uh, we have animations and graphics that are used throughout our uh, hunting and fishing guides, our, uh, you know, park guides and, infographics that we use in, in presentations to share information. And then we have video uh, getting more and more relevant through social media, YouTube, lots of eyes on those things. So if you start to think about where have you seen visual media, it becomes apparent that it's an inherent part of what we see day to day. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about <clears throat> kind of how that this image is just kind of shows how that has progressed over time. Um, the technology has grown immensely in just, you know, a century. Um, it's gone from film to now, uh, you know, cloud-based storage that we have massive data capacity and gone from uh, film cameras to you having a cell phone that can shoot 4K. So if you look at, and on the far right image, a little goofy image, but just made me think, uh, you know, it's important to know what's relevant, but it's just as important to look ahead and and make sure that you're maintaining that relevancy, staying on top of techniques and technology as this is growing so much. 
So why should we be using visual media? I, I When I ask myself this, I just think a picture is worth a thousand words. You can get a lot of information uh, to a lot of people a little bit easier. You know, it captures attention. Photographs and, and video, they break up text and they, they focus attention on, on certain aspects of an article or an advertisement. Uh, it's relatable. You know, people might see something and it can spark that a memory, that emotion, and it gives them a new context to have to retain that information as well. It's an education tool. It makes things more understandable. Having visual aids helps clarify and helps people comprehend more complex concepts. Um, and it makes it a little more understandable for the general public too. And then it's also very efficient. It's fast. There's been research that says humans process visuals up to 60,000 times faster than text. Um, and in a world where people are scrolling through their feeds, having that eye catching and aesthetic content is is really what sets people apart. So it's important that we that we focus on it. So these are just a few graphics that I was able to find a little visual media to enforce the importance of visual media. Uh, a couple facts from these that I really found interesting. The average person spending two hours and 22 minutes a day on social media. 92% uh, of mobile video consumers sharing videos. 55% of people watch videos daily. So it's definitely, there are people out there who are definitely using this. So where are we using it? I use Nebraska Game and Parks as an example. Uh, the four primary ones that I thought of, uh, the first is social media. I mean, if you look at the followings there, we've got four, over 40,000 Instagram followers, over 125,000 Facebook followers. Um, these are people who are seeing this almost daily. So it's a great resource. We have our own webpage, outdoornebraska.gov or outdoornebraska.org. Um, it's really the all-stop shop for information on our organization um, and a really complete source throughout the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, what work we're doing and um, things like that. And then we have presentations. I mean, there's research and projects being done statewide constantly. And we're doing in-person meetings, virtual meetings, that you know, if someone's solely talking, it's not as engaging to the audience. So utilizing visual media to even augment those presentations is a, is a great tool for it as well. And then we have print, um, Nebraska Land. Again, it's an award-winning publication that we have that's coming out monthly. Uh, we have our public access atlas and other guides that are offering really valuable information and they're using those visual, ma the maps and other visual media to help uh, get that information across to the public. So how to use it? Um, you know, we, should, we know we should, and we know where it is used, but how do we do that? Um, you know, the, the first step is having a story. What are you going to tell? Um, Nebraska Game and Parks does an am amazing amount of work, you know, across the state. So having a project or research or even just a recreational opportunity, uh, you know, having that story to tell is an important part. That's kind of the starting point. Um, and then identifying your audience. If you can do that, you can then steer the content to to satisfy that audience and give them the most valuable information to the point that you're getting across and to match that theme. And can you market uh, multiple audiences? Are there, is there a broad audience or is it honed in? So really finding um, who's gonna be viewing this and, and catering that to them. And then the last step really is just having the gear. And that can range a lot. I mean, it can go from having a cell phone and pointing it to running a full scale production with cinema cameras and drones and audio recording equipment. So it's a simple concept, but there's a large spectrum there. And then these are just some images of, uh, you know, just showing that spectrum of what you can do for gear. I mean, again, cell phones right now are pushing the envelope and what they can do in terms of filming and taking photographs. But then on top of that, you know, the, the technology with, with professional cinema cameras and, and drones <clears throat> and audio recording, it's, it's a lot that we can do with it really. And we have a lot in our uh, arsenal. And so I have a little video here that uh, I'm just going to share. It's kind of a sample reel of what I've been able to work on um, over the last you know, year and a half with Game and Parks.
Hunting is also a great way to get outside, enjoy the great natural beauty our state has to offer, and spend that family time together. Nebraska Game of Parks has a lot of programs that help you train, so if you've never hunted before, don't let that be an obstacle. Nebraska, derived from an indigenous word meaning flat water, referring to the wide and flat Platte River that flows across our state. Nebraska's aquatic resources provide critical habitat to lots of aquatic animals that call our state home, including fish. I, I know Zoom isn't the most uh, resilient when it comes to sharing videos. So uh, in the chat, I threw up a, a YouTube link with that video if you want to watch it without the choppiness, which I'm assuming you all saw. So, <laughs> um, so I want to get into a little bit of you know effective filming techniques. We know what visual media is. Uh, like I said, I focus on video production. So I wanted to get into some of the details and techniques that I use that you maybe can use in the field yourself or just familiarize yourself. So the first uh, step really is framing. Uh, and that's basically just gonna be composing that video, that video shot or a photo. And this is really crucial in creating that aesthetically pleasing media. Um, there's a few simple rules or techniques that people use. The first um, and a really common one is using the rule of thirds. And this is basically just utilizing the golden ratio, which in that middle uh, golden little swirl there, um, it's a shape that's seen commonly throughout nature, not a list shells and formations of galaxies and there's been research done showing that this using this kind of technique and, and framing can is perceived as pleasing to the eye so how you do this is by using thirds of the image so in that bottom grid there you'll see those plus signs and putting your subjects in those areas really helps create this kind of simple and pleasing look uh, the gentleman on the top right on the top photo on the left there is kind of in that third section that right third section section of the photo. The horizon in the drone image is kind of in the top third there. So simple little ways you can frame a shot. Um, symmetry is another easy way to give something a clean and eye-catching look. The damselfly there on the bottom is right in the center and it gives it a nice simple clean look to it. And it's, a, it's a, another way to frame that you can use yourself. Um, another few ways that you can shoot things include looking ahead room or lead room. Uh, again, that top photo, having that space in front of him gives up an open, more relaxed feel to the shot. Um, doing a long shot or a landscape shot like the drone image. Full shots are going to have the entire subject. Medium shots from waist up. Um, you can do close-ups, extreme close-ups like that damselfly again. You know, getting the getting the face, getting even just an eye or those really tight detail detail shots. So there's a lot of ways to do framing and and different ways you can use it and compose shots. So the next part would be lighting. And a lot of what we film is ends up being outside. So the first thing you have to really consider is, is weather conditions and cloud cover. Um, how much is there sunlight? Is it, uh, you know, is it broken up by clouds? Is it very high intensity? Um, and then you can get into using natural lights, always preferable. So if you can use those weather conditions to your advantage, that's great. Having supplemental lighting is always helpful as well. You can use single point, just a, a light in front of the subject or three point lighting systems uh, that are a little more professional. And then really when you're doing lighting, what you're looking out for is exposure. Um, that's gonna be how bright or how dark an image is. And when you're doing that, you can even fine tune that to highlights and shadows and making sure that your bright parts of the image are not too bright and those dark parts aren't all the way dark. And then the last part of lighting kind of has more to do with color, but it comes from the light that's hitting you. Uh, that's light temperature. You'll see cool blue light and warm. I'll show in the next some images to help clarify these kind of concepts. So on the top left, like I said, that cloud cover, you can have a overcast day versus zero clouds. Those are going to change how you're, how you're shooting, the settings you're using on your camera, where you're positioning your subjects and things like that. The top right, you'll notice the professional lighting setup. That's very, um, you know, controlled setting and, and a really nice little backdrop there. And then on the bottom left, you'll see that color temperature. Again, that 
has more to do with color, but it is based on the um, you know temperature that that light is putting out. Fluorescent lights will um, you know be a lot different than a than a sunset lighting from natural light. And then on the bottom right uh, has more to do with that exposure aspect. Uh, you know, the, of those forest images, you'll see one of them is really dark, and those shadows you really can't see any details. On the middle image of those three, you'll see it's really bright, overblown out, and you can't really get much detail again in those leaves. And then that far right photo, you kind of get some details in the shadows, and the highlights aren't blown out either. So that's a that's an evenly exposed photo. Um, so after light, you can focus on audio, especially this is with obviously with video. And when, again, with being outside, focusing on things like wind and ambient noise is really important. Um, if wind's hitting a microphone, you're not going to really get any audio um, if it's hitting where that receiver is on the on the microphone, or even just having road noise or other conversations around can really change what your microphone's capturing. So keep being attentive to that. Um, peaking, making sure that your audio levels aren't so low that you can't hear them, but not blowing out that microphone so you're not capturing that that valuable audio. And then just knowing what kind of microphones you have access to and what are available. Um, you know, having an internal mic on your cell phone versus a, you know, fancier lavalier mic that can go right on someone's chest and get really clear dialogue. Um, just having, knowing those things are out there and, and what will work best for your scenario. Then another thing we use a lot on our, uh, on our videos are graphics and animation. The first of which, and probably the most common is gonna be text treatment, um, text overlay, using um, written text to help get messaging and narrative across um, a lot of the times people won't have their speakers on. So if you're only using voiceover, they're not getting that. So having text can be another way to kind of make sure they're getting that necessary information. Um, excuse me, using infographics, uh, we have an awesome graphic design team that's constantly making really, really neat charts and graphs to consolidate and, and really simplify a lot of complex information that's being, uh, you know, done by our biologists and other research. And then maps and range, you know, um, there's a lot of parts in Nebraska people might not know about. So having, uh, you know, a map to give people that frame of reference where they are, or even, you know, using ranges of a map to show wildlife and, and other things like that. So then getting into the, the stages of filmmaking, you know, kind of the process. The first one is going to be pre-production. This is going to be where you're identifying the topic for a project. And then figuring out who's going to be on that production team, you know, who's going to be valuable and whose input's going to really, we're going to want for that. Um, that team's going to come up with a timeline for that project and probably a deadline to have it done, um, have an outline for the general structure and theme. And those help steer a shot list, which is a really important part of having a, a desired list of what valuable footage you, you'd want and what you want to have for this project. Then it gets to shooting. And that's obviously going to be the days where you're out there capturing media. And uh, it is going to require an awareness of what your scenario is at the filming site, you know, checking weather, making sure that it's going to work, um, coordinating with your production team and making sure everyone knows their role. Uh, everyone who needs to be there is going to be there and knows what their job is that day. And then prepping gear, um, you know, making sure that you have the amount of storage necessary to capture everything. You have all your charged batteries, all those things, making sure that there's uh, enough time to do another very important thing, which is film multiple takes. Uh, it's rare that you get one photo or take one film scene and you've got it perfect. So being able to compose shots in multiple ways and do multiple takes really gives you the best chance at getting high quality footage at the end of it. So once you're done filming and have all your media, you're going to go into post-production, which is where you're assembling all of this um, into a timeline, essentially. That image above is uh, right what we use Premiere Pro, and you basically take all of your video, your, your audio clips, you trim those down, get them in a you know the order you want. You can add those graphics, the text overlay. We really like to add music. It gives that emotional feel to it as well. And then another, probably one of the most important parts of the post-production process is, is multiple cuts and involving that production team on giving input sharing their expertise to make sure that that final product is the best one that you can put out there. So the next slide is really kind of the same thing. It just is a simpler uh, you know, visualization of that timeline. It starts with the inspiration. What's the project? What's the conservation topic um, that you want to talk about and you want to share? And then figuring out the best um, you know, outline structure to, to create that project and what footage is going to make that impactful. And then getting out and require and, and acquiring all of those, um, all the audio and the and the filming that you need, and then finishing it with editing, compiling all that into that that polished final product with everyone's input. 
So, uh, you know, I, we've talked about what visual media is, how to make an effective video, but why are we using it for conservation? And it's very simple. It's because it's been proven to work. You know, there's a lot of research out there showing that uh, watching, viewing nature, not just in person, not just through a window, but even through an image, through video is proven to improve mood. So the BBC was a really prominent study they did um, with California, University of California, Berkeley, where they were watching Planet Earth 2, the, the subjects, and they were shown significant increases in um, amazement, wonder, awe, and significant decreases in fear, nervousness, anxiety. Um, so, you know, those benefits of being in nature that are well documented are now being shown to, you know, you get some of those benefits through just media, through, um, you know, visual media as well. So we know it's effective and I would love to work with you. So I have a little page here with some of my information. There's a little QR code there that you can, you know, probably should be able to scan with your phone and get my contact info in there without having to type it all in. But um, like I said, I'm newer to the organization and I'm, I'm really excited with the work we do. And, uh, you know, I think we've got a lot of capability and we know the need is there for visual media. So we'd love to work with y'all. And now we, uh, Good to hear from Justin Haig, who's a really talented photojournalist with Nebraska Land, and he's going to get more into the details of his conservation storytelling process. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I had the uh, opportunity to preview Nick's uh, um, his uh, presentation a little bit, and I knew he was going to cover a lot of the nuts and bolts of uh, photography and everything, and he, he's, uh, he's an amazing uh, uh, talent that we have on our staff and uh, really, really glad to have him with us. Um, my uh, presentation uh, might be a, a little more abstract, I guess. Um, let's see here. This is my first ever Zoom presentation. Um, let's see. All You'll right. do great, Justin. I'm getting here. Yeah. Slideshow. Things seem to be there we go. All right. Can you see my presentation now? Good. Yes. All right. So anyway, I am going to focus a little bit on what I call the humble still image. You know, we are in very much of a, a uh, media driven society these days. And um, storytelling is more important than ever from a conservation perspective. And um, when you work for uh, the Game and Parks Commission and uh, and an agency that has such a diverse mission, there's no doubt that we need to be a big, big player in the, in telling stories and uh, telling stories of conservation. So um, I want to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to date myself a little bit here. Um, I'm going to talk about the still image, but I do want to talk a little bit about video and growing up as a kid in the 70s and 80s. And this is these are the um, some of the video stars that I remember watching as a kid on, on our one TV station whenever um, something else wasn't on, uh, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and uh, Marty Stauffer's Wild America. So some of the, some of the first uh, conservation storytellers from, from a video perspective. But of course that has, uh, I still, you know, I'm a, very much a, shoot a little bit of video uh, myself, but uh, very much consider myself a still, still photographer, um, but I'm amazed by today's videography that uh, guys like Nick do and, uh, and uh, anything that's narrated by David Attenborough as, as uh, Nick mentioned. Um, getting into the still photography, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, conservation storytelling and how I got into this, uh, into this career. Um, I, grew up in southwest Nebraska down around McCook and I ended up uh, pursuing a journalism degree always uh, you know enjoyed shooting photos and I could put a sentence together um, and after that I, I uh, went into work at newspapers in uh, Shadron and, and McCook so uh, I have a journalism background and then I got a job at Shadron State College and I was the media and public relations coordinator there for 12 years covered a whole lot of speeches and uh, meetings and stuff like that through the years. Um, this was by far the favorite speaker that I ever um, covered while I was working at Shadron State College. Um, 
Michael Forsberg, who is probably the Dean of Conservation Storytelling in Nebraska, um, who I consider to be. It was the Great Plains Lecture Series at Shattern State College on October of 2010. And I remember sitting in the auditorium and uh, listening to him, uh, he'd show these big, huge still images up on the, up on the, the, the uh, screen and you just felt a connection with the animals. And, you know, there's, a, I remember that him talking about how he got that mount lion image down there um, and that how, uh, how, how important these, these animals were and how they're, they're threatened and a lot of them. And so just really had a great way of tying images to conservation at that moment, that was like a transformative moment to me. I was like, okay, I, I carry a camera around. I'd like to, uh, you know, I've always, I had, had, I think, a 200 millimeter lens at the time, so tried shooting wildlife. But at that time, I had just paid off my student loan, so decided to go out and uh, buy a 500 millimeter zoom lens at that time and go shoot as many creatures, shoot photos of as many creatures as I could. So um, then lo and behold, I found out a job opening in late 2012 um, after I'd been shooting those photos for a few years. A job opening came with a game in parks and um, Bob Greer, who was a uh, um, great photographer out um, in this area, worked out of Alliance. You know, I work out of Shattern. Um, he, he had retired, so uh, uh, that there was a job opened up and uh, decided to pursue it and have been at it since then. And um, I'm fortunate because in a lot of ways, it still, still feels like a new job to me. I've been at it since January of 2013. Um, so anyway, I want to talk a little bit about um, Nebraska Land Magazine itself, you know, and its rich history, um, you know, going back to even, even before uh, Marty, Marty Stauffer, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, Outdoor Nebraska, and Nebraska Land um, with, paving the way for uh, conservation messaging in this state. Um, and it's something that uh, really attracted me to this position was to have a role in the, in the producing that magazine and creating content for it. So I think, you know, it started in 1926 and you can see that image down on the, the lower left-hand corner. That is the first issue of Outdoor Nebraska. Um, if you go over to the right in 2015, um, you can see a picture there. Um, you know, a lot of our themes are still the same as they were back in 1926, even though our equipment's gotten better and the, and uh, the, things look a little flashier than they do back did back then but you can see a boy boy fishing the boy on the right there just happens to be my son um, fishing there in 2015 and then of course uh, you can see in 2022 that's the latest issue of Nebraska land there um, just a, a nationally re renowned publication more than 22,000 subscribers and we put a lot of that content you know you can read the whole thing online so we you know our, our uh, reach goes far beyond those uh, 22,000 print subscribers for sure. Um, this is just a, a little radius map that shows where our, our communications division staff is in Nebraska. I am the only member of the communications team west of North Platte. I'm the, the circle up there in the, in the top left. I work out of Shattern, like I said. Um, I have the big, uh, big playground of the, of the panhandle. Um, to, to uh, work with. And uh, I always tell this joke whenever I give a presentation, but uh, the, the initials of my job title are PIO for public information officer. Um, but uh, a lot of my coworkers refer to me as SOB, as in lucky, lucky SOB for, for all of the, the great landscapes and great critters that I get to, uh, to uh, photograph out in this country. So um, just a sampling of some of the different uh, types of images that uh, um, we get to chase as, as a Nebraska land photographers, you know, hunting, fishing, um, conservation, you know, the huge, there's, a, like I said, there is a huge uh, mission with the game and parks. So, you know, a lot of uh, anything outdoor recreation and parks related, uh, we like to, uh, Get, get nice images of that. Um, also a conservation project such as prescribed burns and uh, all the important, you know, stocking pheasants and stuff like that, stocking fish, all the important stuff that our, our co-workers in, in game and parks do um, get, to, get to document a lot of that. Um, 
beautiful places out this way, as I mentioned, you know, sunrises and sunsets. And Nick talked a little bit about the importance of great light. Um, that's when we're trying to get out is when that light is good and when we're showing Nebraska in its uh, in its best light. And so, uh, you know, these are some of the some of the places I get to photograph, whether it's uh, Soldier Creek or Smiley Canyon or Walgreen Lake, Fort Robinson, the Ogallala Grasslands, Wildcat Hills, the Sand Hills, all that stuff. Uh, just uh, beautiful, beautiful places that uh, get to play around in. So. Um, and then there's these fellows. And, and like I said, after listening to uh, Michael Forsberg speak, um, that these are kind of the, the friends that drove me to this, to this profession and all the different critters that uh, uh, all, the, all, all my fantastic neighbors. I, sometimes in these presentations, I'll, people will ask me, what's my, what's my favorite animal to photograph? And it's always whatever animal is in front of the camera at the time. It doesn't really matter. I can have as much fun with a garter snake in the backyard as a, as a, as a big elk or whatever else, you know, it's, it, it's a just um, fun, to, fun to get nice, nice images of them. So, and the nice thing about animals is uh, coming from a newspaper background, uh, sometimes you'd get a complaint from somebody about how they looked in a photograph. I've yet to have an animal complain about how they've looked at how they look in a photograph. So um, this is uh, one of my favorite things to do. And one of, you know, I'm not alone in this. This is something a lot of uh, uh, wildlife photographers do. We're always looking for ways to get uh, get close to the close to the animals. This is just a, a grass blind kind of make a cave and get get uh, near a shoreline somewhere and uh, and wait for uh, um, the birds to uh, come in or get there before they wake up uh, it's usually the idea and uh, get try to uh, get get as close as possible to get good photographs and this is a uh, this is actually a cell phone image that uh, I shot over the top of my blind one morning several years ago it's been quite a few years ago when this happened but uh, I think I left a little after three o'clock in the morning to get out in the blind um, set it up a day or two before and went out to a pond here pretty close to Shattern and you didn't know what was really going to come in this was uh, I think it might have been in June um, but you had a, a flock of American avocets fly in you know and so they were certainly welcome and they uh, waited back and forth uh, in front of the blind, and I was able to uh, get a lot of photographs of them. And lo and behold, this image shows up on the on the cover of the Nebraska Land Calendar the the next um, year. So, you know, I had no idea that I was going to be shooting the uh, the uh, cover for for the Nebraska Land Calendar that morning, but uh, it, it made getting up that early and getting out to, in that blind worth it. So. Um, As Nick said, you know, we have all a great design staff in, uh, in Lincoln. We have a great um, social media manager. We have a, 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 get a lot of direction from, uh, from our supervisors. And, you know, it takes a big team to do what we do. And I am always, uh, it's always fun to see where all of the, the images that I shoot, my coworkers shoot, show up for, for Game of Parks. And these are, you know, you got uh, news releases, um, send, send out photos with them a lot of times. They show up in, the, in um, weekly and daily newspapers. You got your turkey guide, big game guide, fishing guide, whatever, you know, a myriad of, uh, of different brochures. Um, and as Nick said, social media is huge. And I, I'm always, uh, Glad to see uh, um, them pop up on the Nebraska land and Nebraska Game and Parks Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, Twitter to, to see those images and sharing important uh, messages like uh, prescribed burning, um, stuff like that. Um, we have a lot of partnerships throughout the state. Um, a lot of times people come to us looking for images, whether it's the um, Nebraska um, Tourism Commission, is, you know, that's one of the tourism state tourism guides that they put out. That's a picture I got that I shot from a, from a hot air balloon there that ended up on the cover of that. So um, just a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of different places our images show up. Um, these are a few examples of the different uh, magazine 
um, stories that I've done and from my backyard, um, pretty much I call the Pine Ridge my backyard because that's where I live, but uh, conservation messages like uh, preserving the Pine Ridge, that's a, a story about uh, forest management uh, within the state or within the Pine Ridge and, and uh, the important work that our Game and Park staff and its partners are doing um, to, to make a more sustainable forest um, in the Pine Ridge. There's, you know, we get to do some adventure stuff of backpacking the Pine Ridge Trail was probably the, the, the hardest one of those I, I've ever done for sure because it ended up with uh, several blisters, but it was definitely rewarding. Um, got to um, document that and then there's a, uh, just uh, like this Buttes of the Breakout story. It was a story about the Cheyenne Buttes at Fort Robinson. Um, so like I say, lots of, uh, you get to cover a lot of different things and find different ways to use our images within the magazine. I'm gonna move on. Um, this is um, probably my favorite and, and um, best example of conservation storytelling that I've had since I started uh, working for Game and Parks. And it's, you know, when I was sitting there in that auditorium listening to Michael Forsberg speak um, and saw that picture of the mountain lion and how it moved me and everything, I, I dreamed, you know, that there'd be a day that maybe I'd get a picture of a mountain lion. Well, lo and behold, about the time I started working for Game and Parks, the Game and Parks was really ramping up its uh, research into mountain lions. So I got a lot of access to uh, to uh, photograph these these uh, magnificent creatures. And so this, you know, from this um, photograph here, I'm just I I was going to make it look a little fancier, but uh, Tim Raggart put a lot of work into the design and the in the uh, in the magazine, so I thought I just uh, might as well um, show the pages as they were. Um, so there you go, you have a, a, a cat in a tree, and then you, you know, it's this, then you can show the cat and uh, the cache, um, how it caches um, um, a deer when it, after it kills a deer, um, you know, and, and I was able to take each of the, these images, this was probably over four years that I captured all these different images. And so was able to take each image and help tell the story of the mountain lion, a highly misunderstood species within the state. Um, you know, talk about the, uh, the kittens and how they're born with spots and, and how that provides camouflage and, and, those, and of course those rich blue eyes that they have, which are, are really, really, you know, it's like Nick talked about getting in on close-up images. That's one area where, where close-up image really, really uh, helped show that, I think, and talk about, uh, you know, the, the collaring process. And that, that right there, I was on site with the, when the first mountain lion was collared in the Pine Ridge and uh, um, came in parks staff and, and uh, got to be there to witness. And in some of the conversations I've had with, um, with people is, you know, it's, it's really important to, before you even pick up a camera or a video, whatever it may be, to think about what is that story that you want to tell first. And I know you spoke to that in your presentation, Nick, but can you um, speak to that a bit more? Like, do you have, find yourself helping people just think about their story first before you even like what's that what's that look like for you with like, yeah helping, yeah, helping people craft question. their own story I guess can you speak to yeah that? that fits well into that kind of production timeline you know starting yeah. with that inspiration I'm rarely you know the people out in the field the biologists um, you know the park workers they're the ones who are kind of the experts on this topic so they're the ones who right. are, hey I'd love to tell this story my role is normally um to try to help like consolidate that, you know, a little bit or, or, or focus that towards, again, that audience that you want. Um, normally having a few main themes, almost like when you're coming up with an education program, what are yeah, the objectives yeah. of that? What are the mm -hmm. objectives of this video? Is, it, is it, it's, it's very similar. I, with my background in education, it's surprising how often how, or how many, you know, similarities there are between planning education programs and planning a, um, you know, video project, because it is a really great education tool. So oh, I can uh, see that. 
Yeah, yeah, I definitely think that uh, collaboration and, and, you know, using their expertise on the material and, and my ability to help, um, you know, c create concise and, and digestible media, that's, that's kind of the first step there. And a lot of that has to do with identifying the primary themes, um, those goals of like, what kind of shots would, would invoke that emotion, like you were saying, like getting, you know, the right subjects, like a parent and child and frame and those kind of things to, um, kind of get that emotional aspect of that message across as well. That's really good. Yeah, and Shauna added thinking about the story, but also thinking about the value you're providing for the audience. So that's excellent yeah. to the value. Um, I think about the, the parallel you just mentioned between education program development and maybe a video. I absolutely agree with that. And I, mm -hmm. whenever I'm speaking with people about like what kind of program they're trying to help you know, to create, I always ask them, um, what do you want people to walk away feeling? What do you want people to walk away knowing or understanding? And then it's like you work backwards from that. And that's what, so that's kind of cool. It's, it sounds like it's- Yeah, really similar that's process. exactly right. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for that um, quick segue. Justin, sorry, sorry about your internet, but we are ready to go if you want to carry on. Am I back up? Okay. So can you see my screen again? Yep. I can see it. I can, and I can hear okay. you. So we're good. Yeah. Sorry about that. Darn it. I don't know what's going on, but anyway, I, uh, I will buzz through these pretty quickly because I, I don't, I have a feeling I'm going to get cut off again. So I don't want that to happen. But anyway, um, this is, uh, just another, uh, cat that I got a photograph of. Here are some others. Um, so Sam Wilson, uh, Lindsay Blake, Maria Baglieri and Greg Shinbeck, uh, doing some great work with mountain lions there, collaring one in the middle of the night. Um, also that uh, cat that Sam is holding there is the same cat that is to the right of the image. So it was cool that I got to photograph that cat as a kitten and photograph it as it, when it got a little bigger. So, um, you know, talked to, uh, in this about uh, cats, um, you know, showing multiple cats in one picture, a lot of the when people get those on their trail cams, they think they're adults hunting in packs, but it's actually always generally just a mother and its kitten. So important, important messages like that within conservation storytelling. Got to go on the first mountain lion hunt, so I uh, had pictures of that to go with it. Um, also other species um, that uh, benefit from the mountain lion kills. There's been some research done on that. So uh, by putting a camera trap up on a, on a mountain lion kill, I got pictures of golden eagles and black-billed magpies um, taking advantage of that. Also the, uh, the genetic research with the scat survey dog, um, went out hiking with them on that. Um, so clusters, cluster searches, a um, lot, uh, lot of great work that they did and tried to document it to the best, best of my ability. Um, even a picture like this, I about threw it away, but uh, it ended up in, in print. It uh, kind of helps uh, show people the profile of a mountain lion compared to say a bobcat. Even a picture like this can help you, you know, how that long tail is an identifier. Um, and it made a nice, uh, nice uh, way to end that spread. So, like I said, if I uh, if I had my way, um, I was very fortunate that uh, our editor Jeff Curris decided to put uh, to devote this much space to to that story. And uh, if I had my way, I uh, any species I write about, I'd like to get 22 pages on it. But uh, this one, I, it was fun because I got that much space. Um, this is. From this month, I'll get put in a little plug for this month's Nebraska Land Magazine um, landings turtle story that I did. Um, little conservation storytelling there. So please uh, go visit uh, visit that online or pick a print edition of the of the magazine. So beyond that, I uh, think there's some of the my contact information and some of the places where you can see my work. So appreciate. Uh, Appreciate everybody coming today, and thanks for the invitation for having having me and Nick speak. Um, you know, like I say, uh, very fortunate to have a lot of talented co-workers with, along with a great design staff, and uh, um, encourage you all to get out and create some imagery. Excellent. Thanks so much, Justin, uh, for sharing that story. Um, if I'm going to wait, we have a few minutes. If anyone has questions for Justin and for Nick. Um, but while you're thinking, 
Um, I always have questions, if that's cool. So I just want to hear from you, um, I guess, what's been, I guess, Justin, specifically with that mountain lion uh, story, did you, did, do you feel like it did what you wanted to do? Do you feel like it really helped people, you know, take a deeper look and understand what was the reception um, from maybe that particular story? Because that was a nice example story. Yeah, you know, I, I got a lot of uh, positive comments on that story, and I, I uh, feel like it, uh, it did, did well, but there's always, um, you know, we, that wasn't the only place that it showed up was in Grant. We were able to use a lot of that in our social media efforts to nice. get a lot of those, you know, it was kind of uh, formatted in a way that was friendly for sending, the, sending it out to, for social media, so. Um, yeah, I think it, it did, but people are bombarded with so much information these days. It's yeah. hard to, hard to make an impact. And, and, you know, you're always, always trying to, trying to, uh, trying to do that, but it, it's tough. I, I feel like, uh, just so you know, I utilize that story often when I'm thinking about how to even speak or things, key points to speak about mountain lion, um, ecology. So, it does have an impact probably beyond what you what you see. So that's that's pretty cool. That's great. Well, thank you both so much. I feel like we could do like three more webinars on this topic. <laughs> a lot of good questions. And obviously there's a need for this type of stuff. You know, like Nick, um, you mentioned at the beginning, we live in a visual media world. We're saturated by it. So how can we leverage our conservation stories and get at the table with that, with that visual media? And I think you both do an incredible job. Um, that's why I, I specifically asked you guys to, to help with this because I know that you are amazing storytellers in your media. So thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I'll be reaching out to you with more resources, contact and uh, the recording of this. And then if you have any questions about this series or education, um, please reach out to me as well. And I'd love to speak with you more. So thanks everybody. Have a great day. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Bye.